Rehabilitation Research and Training Center on Independent Living Management presents Pioneers in Disability Rights and Community Organizing. An interview with Bob Kafka. Hi, I'm June Tales. I'm here with Doug Usiak interviewing Bob Kafka. Bob, can you begin by telling us how you got involved with community organizing and, and what type of community organizing you, you, you have been involved with? Well, I suppose it started just getting involved with the local uh, disability rights uh, coalition, the Coalition for Barrier Free Living in Houston, Texas. It was uh, at the time, you know, sort of taking on the traditional issues, you know, housing, architectural barriers, transportation things like that and had the committee that was I was pretty newly injured and just got involved and uh, I found out pretty quickly that uh, if you raise your hand or say you want to do something you sort of sort of gravitate to the chair of the committee pretty quick so you know I started there that that group actually evolved into the local independent living center and then I you know also got involved you know as the years went on with the state coalition, the Coalition of Texans with Disabilities, which also worked on various, some of the same type of issues. And it was all through the period of, you know, 504 and the ADA. So there was a lot of sort of energy and uh, a lot of the stuff was brand new, you know, in terms of that. And everybody was sort of working together and cross disability was sort of like actually working at that time, you know, in terms of that people sort of really believed it. And, you know, sort of was wed to it, and some of the, you know, balkanization that's today is wasn't quite as you know obvious back then. So, um, and then uh, as I you know got more and more involved, I um, had heard about uh, a group called you know Adapt that they you know did trainings on community organizing, and I uh, got this uh, thing in the mail. It was a a poster that said, don't flush, organize, and had a bus in, in a toilet, you know, and it was sort of illustrating that, you know, the bus didn't have a lift. And uh, at the time, I was a VISTA volunteer, uh, and I went uh, to D.C. thinking I was going to a traditional sort of, like, classroom training. And uh, though they did have some classroom, you know, direct action training in it, uh, I also ended up sitting in front of a bus real quickly, uh, which sort of taught me real quickly that, uh, you know, the combination of classroom and actually doing it on the streets is really the, the best way of learning. You can't do it just by sitting in a classroom or watching a computer or, you know, just, you know, you can't get empowered that way. You really have to get out there and do it. And it also sort of taught me about how you can sort of get in touch with your anger, you know, about authority and some of the things that are wrong. Um, it was real interesting, you know, at that time when I was a VISTA, the uh, Reagan administration had just put in regulations that VISTAs could not engage in any protesting. So um, I didn't realize that, uh, you know, not only was I breaking a federal law by protesting, I also got arrested for the first time real quickly, even though I had said I was never going to get arrested. So, but. You know, we had uh, did a protest against the American Public Transit Association, one of many that occurred. So it was a sort of a an evolution of sort of traditional uh, organizations, coalitions at the local and state level, and then I started getting more involved in what is you know direct action organizing. Bob, what are the traits of a successful organizer, and what kind of skill sets do they need? I think number one, you know, when because we do trainings, is I really think you need to look for anger. You need need to have somebody that really is angry about some of the situations that people with disabilities, you know, again, and I think part of the trainings is to try to focus that anger. You know, anger just itself is not very very productive. But focused anger can, I think, really start moving a person to doing that. And I, I think that the, the passion is, is kind of lost in a lot of the sort of advocacy things that we see in our community. I mean, we've gotten too intellectual. And so, you know, in a, when we do and look for, you know, people who are going to, you know, get involved and stay involved, 
uh, you have to have that sort of like low burn going, you know, all the time. And, and without that, without the passion, it's just, uh, you know, it, it, it's usually they're not successful. The other is, is somebody that doesn't mind sort of, you know, dealing with what I call the micro. You know, organizing is not, you know, very flashy. I mean, the true thing is to really holding things together, making the phone calls, pulling it together. Every, everybody, you know, wants to be, you know, sort of on, on the TV or the media, but, you know, somebody has to do all the real work, the detail stuff. So, you, you know, you really want somebody that's going to stay committed to details and actually follow through on things because that is really what's going to hold it together in terms of that. So I think those two, those two traits, you know, uh, are, the, are the things that I think you know, make up, you know, the, you know, the potential of a good, you know, organizer. You know, I mean, dealing with people, you know, sort of understanding not, you know, not having too much of an ego that you are the leader able to, you know, interact and work with folks is kind of really important too. What are the key principles and values in, in community organizing? Well, I think it's it's really the that it's very similar to what I you know the independent living philosophy is that people who are uh, affected need to be the the ones taking action. You know, the two basic thing is to you know getting a large number of people together communally to to bring about the social change that you want. You know, and the also the other key is to recognize that uh, it's a, a power struggle, you know, and that you have you want to change the power relationship between the situation we're in and whatever what we call the target or the you know the enemy or however you want to couch it. And you know, I've just seen that if you don't if you don't look at things in terms of a power analysis, you know, you're just lost. I mean, it's it's sort of like the difference between what I would call you know, what I first began, the education. You know, if we could just educate folks, you know, we could change them. And, you know, nobody ever says, well, what happens when they say no? You know, and it, it's, a, it's a game of power. And I think what community organizing is about is to change that power relationship and to, to deal with them unequal. Because, you know, when the power relationship is unequal, you know, they will never deal with you. And so that's, that's I think, fundamental to... To community organizing is just sort of changing that that power relationship so that you're dealing with whoever you know the the other the entity is that you're trying to change you know that you're dealing with them as an equal. Bob, can you talk about the the role models, the mentors you had, and your advice for how people can go about finding and and using mentors that that want to get involved or are involved. Well, the first, I think, was, you know, had nothing to do with sort of community organizing or organizational. Is just, you know, after I broke my neck, it was, a, you know, a high-level quadriplegic gentleman who was in the VA hospital. I mean, he was, he was just sort of a, a guy that just sort of, you know, did his life every day and sort of overcame. So that was sort of a, you know, a, I wouldn't call him a mentor, but it was sort of a, my, my first sort of thing about, you know, you just have to sort of, take your disability and move forward, you know, so it was that. Um, the guy that we've learned from was, wasn't a disabled person, but a community organizer from Chicago, a gentleman named Shell Trapp, who basically, um, when I went to the first action, uh, did some of the classroom stuff, but then also he did some of the attendant care work for the people who were in the training. You know, he was there putting people onto the toilet, basically feeding people, as well as the trainer. So, he wasn't distant from, he was basically part of, you know, and that, I've held that really kind of close that, you know, that we don't just go in, that we're part of the, the people that we're with, and if so, if it's feeding people or assisting people, it's, it's all something that sort of builds community and things like that. And then just, you know, again, other, other folks, uh, you know, again, this may sound a little corny, but just the sort of average disabled person that, you know, t gets up at 4 o'clock in the morning to get, you know, to work at, you know, at 8, you know, takes the four hours. You know, those are the folks that we don't hear about. They're not the flashy people. They're not the name sort of leaders in the disability community that sort of, I think, make up, you know, and have really built, you know, our disability rights community. So it's, it's, been, it's been sort of like not some of the name people, but really some of just the 
the folks that just sort of, you know, do it every day and just sort of overcome, you know, and, and make it happen. In your history of being involved in the variety of activities that you've been involved, w would you identify as your most proudest moment in community organizing? I think, well, again, I mean, you know, ADAPT has done so many different actions, and each one has a different sort of style and flavor, you know, in terms of that, that it, it's really, I mean, I think really it, it was the most recent action we did in terms of uh, we uh, did uh, an action against three of the unions, the American Federation, and C F AFL-CIO, the AFSCME, and SEIU, three of the unions that uh, have actually, we think, been part of the problem of keeping people warehoused in institutions. And we did an action where simultaneously we took over th all three buildings at the same time uh, with the similar demand and that we now have are going to be having meetings with the presidents of all three of those unions. Um, what was really good about it was not just that we got the meetings with you know three of the most powerful union presidents in the country, which is exciting, but it was the logistics of doing three simultaneous hits with people with significant disabilities, and it was it it it, it went off like clockwork. So it really and. You know, what was really good about it is that, you know, we break up into teams and everybody did what they were supposed to do and we ended up in the right, the right place at the right time. Uh, and we all had the same demands and that was, I think, you know, something that was really kind of, you know, exciting. What will come of it is still, you know, remains to be seen. I suppose the other was just sort of, we did a, a, a really excellent uh, action where we took over the rotunda of the Capitol. Uh, during the Americans with Disabilities Act, the passage, you know, it had gone through the Senate very quick and it stalled in the House. And, uh, you know, we were mostly focused on the transportation piece of the ADA, but, you know, access as a civil right became our chant. And it's sort of like, I think, you know, though ADAP worked mostly on the transportation piece, I think our style sort of, you know, permeated the whole disability community and the whole advocacy for ADA. We sometimes get credit for passing the ADA. I don't think that's you know, quite accurate. You know, it, we were mostly focused on the transportation piece, but I think we set the sort of tone. But we, you know, we had come into town. The ADA had stalled, uh, and then we just uh, about 500 people. You know, went into the rotunda. We were in uh, all in different circles, and we had the people who were willing to be arrested in this very center that had chains. Uh, it was before they had metal detectors and stuff <laughs> hidden in terms of that. Then we had, you know, the, each circle that was, you know, more and more or less and less willing to get arrested to the outside group. So when the, the actual, when we started chanting, because you're not supposed to make any noise in the rotunda. So when the chanting started, um, you know, uh, when the police came and they started to threaten arrests, then the people who were on the outside could peel off and then just those who were there with the chains, and so that was another one. And I think it really set the tone. Excuse me. Um, we uh, had worked with, uh, b you know, before the actual chanting started, we had gotten uh, Pat Wright to get uh, the uh, Speaker of the House and Steny Hoyer to come down. You know, there was this little, little to do in the center there. It was kind of a, you know, this uh, grandmother from Chicago was talking about you know, just spend one day in my shoes and you'll understand uh, as he grabbed, you know, grabbed his hand and shook his hand and things like that. And, you know, they wouldn't make any commitment about, you know, getting the bill, you know, up for a vote. And uh, so, you know, that was when the, you know, we gave the signal and everybody started chanting and they left and the police moved in and they were arrested. And I think, you know, again, uh, it set the tone. It was, you know, broadcast all over the country, you know, to the disability community, and I think it kept the grassroots activism from around the country, though, you know, our numbers in ADAPT may not be large. I think there's a lot of vicarious sort of uh, support for the techniques, you know, that doing that, and I think it kept people sort of energized, you know, for what was the, you know, continuing battle, and then ADA passed not too long after that. So, you know, I think we played a major part in setting the, you know, tone of the 
of the advocacy. Um, let's go back to um, the latest action mm -hmm. and t taking over the three different unions. Um, what kind of organizing, what kind of planning and strategizing <coughs> took place for that to happen so well, I think? Okay, well, the first, the first thing is, you know, we, we had to identify, you know, the locations of where, where we wanted to go and then what were the demands, you know, what we wanted from, from, the, uh, from the unions. I mean, you know, frequently, you know, people just don't, you know, you don't know what, what you want. And so we knew that we wanted them to endorse the Medicaid Community Attendance Service and Support Act, and we knew that we wanted to meet with them uh, and that we wanted, you know, to uh, assure that they would not warehouse people, you know, f just for jobs. So, you know, that, that was really the first step, you know, and we had to analyze would that move us further in terms of getting Mikasa. And we analyzed that, you know, the Democratic Party is very wed to the unions and that, you know, the Democratic Party had not actually uh, shown a lot of interest and in, in endorsed. So we, we knew that we would never, will never get Mikasa passed without union support. So it's an integral piece in, in the whole, you know, strategy. So, so that was, you know, necessary. You know, you, before you do any kind of action, you have to look at the location. You know, when you're going to have, you know, 500 people, you know, how we were gonna, how we were going to get them there, you know. So we had to look at the, uh, the location, how many doors, you know, elevators, how we were going to get in, were there security guards, you know, those kind of things, you know. Um, we had to look at the streets to make sure that marching that was all accessible, you know, check there was curb cuts, you had to check to see there was no construction, you would be blocked. Then we had to figure out how we were going to get to the different locations um, in a, some kind of orderly sense, you know, in terms of, you know, we were going to march. So, you know, the way it turned out, two of the unions were on L Street, so it was just simple. We had broken into six color teams. Four of the color teams went down L Street. Uh, the, the tail two color teams, uh, instead of going up to L, turned down I Street where the AFL CIO was. So again, you know, we had to do that so that because the police, you know, when you're 500 people marching in the street, you're not exactly invisible. So they would be with us. So we had to, you know, make sure that you know um, we were able to get there in time. We also had communication, so to think about how we were going to communicate between all three locations and, you know, to know exactly what everyone, did you get, you know, a commitment, you know, what we were going to do. So we had to deal with, let's say, we got SEIU to say yes before AFSCME or before the AFL-CIO, or what was this group going to do with the other two. So we, we built we built in where they were going to go. So if SEIU basically said yes first, they were, we knew they were going to go to ask me. If the AFL-CIO said yes first, they were going to go over to ask me and support the others. So we had to just figure out the logistics of where that was. And then there's just the other things of <clears throat> we had to, you know, get the, the food and the, the drinks to everybody. We always, you know, since we're there, usually over lunchtime, you know, we logistically had to get the food and drinks to people to make sure that everyone got, you know, uh, you know, watered and fed, so to speak, in terms of that. So we had to logistically make sure that got the people, you know, in time, you know, and stuff like that. And then the night before, we had done a whole bunch of signs, make sure the tape, you know, those are the kind of details that are necessary to do that, you know. And, uh, and then we had to find a staging place that we all were going to meet after. And you know, it turned out to be Lafayette Park right behind <coughs> the White House, you know, so that, uh, you know, so we all ended up in one place. And that's where ultimately we ended up actually eating, you know, and staging. And on that day, we actually, after we ate, marched and we went over to Housing and Urban Development and did a, an action at that, that one right after that afternoon because we you know, had planned that if the unions gave us what we wanted quickly, we would go over to HUD, you know, for, you know, a second action. So, 
So it took, you know, those kind of details. We had, the way we do it is we have a leadership team. We, had, we have 12 leadership team members, and then we have uh, six color teams made up of six people each. So we actually have 36 and 12, 48 people that, you know, are basically day and color leaders that basically make it happen. For those organizations that would be involved in getting individuals interested in taking on some type of action, what type of advice could you give us how to motivate people to, to actually go into the streets and, and to demonstrate or to sit in or to do more? Well, the, the first thing in what we do at local levels where you don't have 500 people, you have to deal with the people at the level they're at at the time. Like, I'm from Texas now, and Texas is very conservative. You know, holding a sign is seen as radical. So you don't actually sit in or block or do something, you know, at first with groups, mostly with groups at the local level. You basically, you know, sort of try to decide, you know, at what level they'd be willing to do. Will they be willing to, you know, go and hand out flyers? Will they just you be able to, willing to stand out with signs? You know, are they... Are they willing to go into the office just sort of and ask for a meeting? You know, and so again, the key is to sort of, you know, one, identify what, what you really want because it's amazing, and this sounds very simplistic, is that people truly don't know what they want. When you say, what's the problem? They'll say, housing. Well, what does that mean? You know, it's, it's not, housing not a problem, not enough Section 8 certificates. You know, people, are, it's very hard to get people to, really focus in on what they want. You know, you, you know, we say transportation, you know, this is a classic, you know, what's the problem? What's your issue? Transportation. Oh, you want steamboats accessible? No. Oh, you want uh, 707s, airplanes accessible? No. Uh, Greyhound buses? No. You know, and again, see, a, a, until you can get it, and sometimes it's as much as I just want to ramp into the local bar so I can get a beer and you organize around that, uh, you know, the grocery store, you know, the whatever, the, the local theater. You know, it, I think sometimes what we do is we start too grandiose and not what really what people want in their real lives. You start there and then you start building. You know, you, you try to find something that will build victories. And that, you know, victories start attracting people. You know, there's nothing better than winning. You know, and then when you do that and, you know, you realize that you can do that, you start building people's power and self-confidence, and that's truly empowerment. You know, it's, it's, you know, what happens, everybody wants to start off and do the ADA ordinance at the local level. Well, most people don't, are not policy wonks. You know, they just want to do what they can. Bob, you talk, you've always talked a lot in your training, and you mentioned today power. Can you expand on some of your views about power and its importance in all this and the kinds of power that we have to acknowledge and, and manipulate and be aware of in all kinds of organizing? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the, the one thing I've learned is to, you know, to do a power analysis and everything. It's, it's, a, it's a battle. It's, you know, you look at, you know, we have to look at things as we want something that they don't want to give us you know, in terms of that. So, and there are many, many different types of power, and you have to just analyze. I mean, what we do in our training is try to focus on people power, but, you know, we know that there's legal and political and monetary power also, plus, you know, just brute force. But I think, I think the key in terms of what we try to do is, is get people to understand that, you know, there's power in numbers, and that, you know, and looking at how we can deal with the power on an equal basis. And what we try to do through all of our confrontational efforts is basically to basically bring about some equality, to sort of change change the power balance so that we we are equals and that we can get to the table with with the power, you know, and then then we can have a chance of getting the change we want. Because, you know, it's one, it's like sort of a fundamental thing. We meet frequently with people that absolutely are hired to keep us away from the person that can say yes. We have sort of a, a classic thing. We ask the question, can you say yes to our demand? And if they say no, I have to bring it to Mr. Jones, 
we just say, well, why are we meeting with you? Why aren't we meeting with Mr. Jones? And so we always direct our, our actions towards those in power that can give us what we want. And, you know, sometimes that takes some analysis. You don't want to go to the mayor if basically it's uh, one of the agency heads that can give you what you want, but frequently you have to go, you know, higher. You know, I've always had a great deal of respect for how you, when you get people involved and you tend to keep them involved, what are your secrets? Well, I, I mean, I'm not sure. It's difficult. I mean, you know, people are, are real busy, you know, and, and what we do is you, you try to find what people's interests are, self-interest, and you try to, you know, deal with what they can give to the organization. You know, I mean, one of the things that's been, I think, exciting about ADAPT is that it has a varied type of individual. I mean, people that have been warehoused in institutions and nursing homes, no education. We have college-educated people, and, you know, we all sort of take a different role. You know, we, we try to, you know, all talk about us. We're all leaders. You know, that's why we have leadership teams, you know, and day, you know, day leaders and color leaders. You know, what we try to do is, as much as possible, you know, give people roles, give people as much input as possible. As we've gotten bigger, it's been difficult. You know, people like to be involved, number one, in, in something that they feel like they own. Uh, and so, you know, if they feel like they have input, not that everybody gets to do everything they want to do, but as long as they feel there's some open input and they're treated fairly, I think that they come back. You know, I mean, uh, I think it's, it's you know, always amazing to me. You know, we have people sleep three, four in a room, we give them cold McDonald's and greasy fries, and they keep coming back, you know, and it, it's amazing. And, you know, uh, you know, and sometimes it's hard to compete with some of what we call now sort of the paid advocates, you know, that get their room paid for and three meals a day and, you know, some of those things. And it's, it's, it's been a little bit more difficult. But I, I think it's, it's sort of like uh, the whole thing of style of community, family, I think people feel that they're part of something and they're making a change and that, you know, they're regarded as doing that and they, they it's, it's almost like family, you know. You know, it, it ADAPT started out as something called the Atlantis Community by Reverend Way Blank and I think, you know, I think he, he hit on the key, Atlantis Community. You know, it, you know, I think people see ADAPT as a community and, you know, again, they feel like they're part of something. And so we try to, you know, give that when we do our trainings. We try to, you know, get people to feel that they are part and they're important to do that. And they are, you know, and that they, you know, their skills, whatever they are. So if you can speak well and, you know, you're the policy wonk, then you can do the paper. But we also, the person with the word board also gets his chance to testify or do whatever it is. How have we gone about building coalitions in, in, in conducting community advocacy change? Um, what we've done is, I mean, ADAPT sometimes doesn't get very strong marks in terms of working and playing well with others. You know, it's uh, not our high suit. You know, we're a, little, we're a little arrogant, I suppose, in some ways. But, you know, we, uh, we, we do work with other groups in terms of trying to, you know, move the issue. I think it's the commonality of the issue. You know, s coalitions are extremely, extremely powerful when there's a good focus on the issue. But, you know, coalitions are that continue ongoing uh, sort of move towards what I call the vanilla. They, it's really difficult because you have so many factions, you've got so much turf, you get, you're dealing more, t more with just sort of the various different players that you never get around to making any tough decisions. And so that's why coalitions sometimes tend towards, you know, the real mushy. So, uh, so we look where there's commonality and where we can, you know, work together towards that sort of common goal. And that way you don't spend as, as much time on turf and, you know, that kind of thing, which is really rampant in our community. And, you know, I think what has made us, I think, effective is that, you know, we're relatively narrow focused on our interest, you know, and that we, you know, we only have a few issues that we work on at a time, and so we're laser-like in that way, and I think that helps the effectiveness, and then when we can find groups that work on, on similar issues, those coalitions work really, really well, but, you know, again, 
and, and that helped with you know the legislation like the ADA, and it's it's been helpful in trying to work towards the passage of Mikasa, though that's the strange because we you know we have you know different interests, but you know we know that you can't pass legislation, uh, you know, with one organization alone. Uh, so what we're doing is trying to combine the various different strategies, our direct action with some of their more legislative skills. Bob, y you've stressed the importance of uh, combining organizing training with actually the doing. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how you've integrated the two? Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to my own very first experience. You know, uh, we talked about power, we talked about defining the issue, we talked about, you know, strategy and tactics, and then, you know, we talked, uh, you know, said, well, uh, we have this gentleman from the uh, Federal Transit Administration uh, coming, you know, supposedly for a meeting, and what, it, what ended up was is that we ended up surrounding his car, basically demanding that, you know, he support lifts on buses, you know, as a DO Department of Transportation policy. You know, so again, right there, I, I saw the sort of power relationship. We went from a, you know, a, a head of a, you know, a, a transit administration, you know, to, to basically just a bunch of disabled people. And, you know, it, it sort of, you know, you could, it made the power on paper into something very, very rare, real. So. So we try to sort of illustrate, you know, by, you know, doing confrontational direct action organizing, how, you know, you can bring the power relationship by getting the store owner or, you know, bringing out, you know, the city official who can bring about the change and, and meeting with us. I mean, I can tell you, in, like in Texas, we meet frequently with our lieutenant governor, our governor, you know, our head of our commissioners of our Department of Human Services, and our folks take it as common. Like, everybody just meets with these people. You know, we met with, uh, uh, at the time, Governor Bush, now President Bush, after we did a protest at his, at his mansion. I mean, our folks just now sort of take that as, well, you know, they just meet with us. That's sort of common, you know, because they now just feel like it's, it's their right, you know, in terms of doing that. And what it is is that they're feeling their power. They're, they're re you know, seeing that they will deal on an equal basis and they deserve to be treated and, and met with on an equal basis. I think that that truly really is sort of the, the illustration of the sort of power uh, presentation we do in terms of, you know, people power. After you've done the action uh, that you created or got the door open, mm -hmm. and you sit down and meet. What's the best way to approach those ne negotiations, and how do you know wh when do you realize that a negotiation has come to a standstill? Well, one of the, one of the things is, and and this is something again, like I, I talked earlier about, we don't spend enough time defining our issue, we don't spend enough time planning for the negotiation. You know, what we win on the street, we can lose at the table. You know, the, the purpose of direct action organizing is to get to the table with the power. But again, if you don't get anything, you know, then what you did on the street sort of goes to naught. So the, the first thing is you have to plan your negotiation. You need to go in there knowing what you want, who's going to do it, who, who's going to say what, what you're willing to take, what your fallback position is, because so frequently we go in and it becomes sort of a mushy, sort of philosophical talking around the issue without ever getting two things. We try to couch things in yes and no. Will you give us $1 million for curb cuts, yes or no? You know, and then we stay on that issue until we get some kind of resolution or some kind of, you know, uh, compromise. And we know going in that, you know, we may not get a million, but you know, the bottom line is we won't take less than five hundred thousand dollars. And we know that going in. So if we come out seven fifty or six hundred, you know, they, they feel they've backed us down from the six hundred from I mean from the million to the six hundred, but we know that we were above what we was our, our bottom, you know, line. So I think, you know, that we also, you know, have what we call a lead lead negotiator and other people. 
so that everybody speaks, so it's not just one person speaking. You know, so we, we go in with a, you know, a negotiating team. You know, it could be three, five, you know, and sometimes it's eight, you know, something like that, depending on you know, what, who and what we're negotiating. So, but the negotiation is the key. You know, uh, sometimes in the middle of negotiations, they throw you a sort of curveball that you didn't expect. You know, that we say, you know, we take a time out. You know, let's talk about that. Because what you want to do is not just sort of just jump on something you haven't heard before or agreed upon with the group. Because it's integral that the group, you know, knows and agrees on what the final, you know, yes comes out of it. Otherwise, you don't have, you know, you, you have people really bitter about what came out of it. The other key is after you've done that, you need to communicate to the people that got you to the table, you know, because not everybody who was on the street can go in and negotiate. You then have to report to everybody, and the communication piece is ultimately important because, again, you want to communicate to folks what you got out of that, what was, what was it worth that they spent the time, you know, to do that. So, it's it's uh, you know, uh, real important. You know, the, it seems simple, but the communication piece I think is is key to that. And you know, sometimes negotiations totally fall by the wayside, and you just have to then realize you're back to the streets again. And you have to analyze, are you ready? Can you do that? I mean, you have to go in knowing exactly what your group is willing to do. I mean, because you, if you know that your group is willing to go back to the street, be as aggressive as it was the first time, you have a lot stronger ability to negotiate a hard line. But if you know that you know they're pretty tired, they're fairly burnt out, you know, you know you've got to come out with something because you're not going to be able to go back to the street. They don't have to know that, but, you know, you know that. And so if you don't sort of, like, get something then, you may not get anything at all. So you just have to know those kind of things and, you know, get the feel of your group, you know, before you go into those things. Talk more about that communication piece, mm -hmm. the way you get the information back to all of those armies of people out on the street from the table. Well, like for instance, when we do a national action, there's usually around 500 people. Uh, sometimes we'll get, you know, letters agreeing to a meeting. Sometimes we get letters agreeing to doing something. Sometimes we'll get uh, newspaper articles or things like that. What we do is, after the action, we put together a packet of information, uh, and then we distribute it to everybody that comes. We do a mail out to make sure that everybody gets to that. We try to, we have a, um, everybody that's um, been to an action <clears throat> that has email is on our, what we call, you know, uh, adapt list. That's, you know, it's the name of everybody that's been there. So then we just give out information about what's progressing on whatever it was, whether it was, you know, when the union meeting uh, occurs, we'll, we'll then email everybody what came out of it, you know, in terms of that. You know, again, like this last action, SEIU, we, they've, since the le action, they have endorsed Mikasa. So that letter went out, you know, over the email in terms of as a victory so that people know that the protest actually worked. It's like your communication network in terms of your use of online network is very strong. I never have to worry about knowing what happened here with the depth. I always know within hours. Right. How do you do that? Well, again, we, you know, we have a website. We have people who are knowledgeable. That's what I'm saying. Everybody adds something. We have people who like doing that, you know, the kind of thing, cyber nuts, you know, or whatever, you know, people, whatever they like doing that. And, you know, we, we have the web page. We have that email list. Uh, we have that, you know, the mailing list that gets out. Plus, um, we um, have people who, again, uh, do our media communication, and there's a sort of disability media, and there's disability sort of uh, people who disseminate information far and wide. So what we do is we get stuff out to that, and it sort of multiplies out. So it, it really has, you know, projects the, you know, the, the ADAPT victories or what's going on pretty far and wide, and again, we get a lot of grassroots support of folks that maybe have never been to an ADAPT action, but 
when I go around, I'm always amazed at how many folks think we're doing good stuff. Sometimes we think, you know, since we're protesting that we're seen as the sort of radical edge of it. But I think there's a, you know, lately I've been going around you know, the country quite a bit, and it's, it's quite a high regard. And I think they, they see the, you know, the victories that are bring, bring about some of the change and, you know, makes everybody feel really more powerful. When, it, when do you identify it's time to go to a legislator and also speak to what's some of the best ways to approach legislative support? You know, I, I have this thing, and, and I think it's part of, you know, the whole ADAPT organizing strategy. I call it the sort of pitchfork approach to social change, and the political legislative is one prong of that pitchfork. You know, direct action is important, the political you know, then the, the legal and the lawsuits, and then we have the media, and then just the kind of system bureaucratic. You know, Mikasa is, is the prong, uh, you know, that we're seeing in terms of this issue, which is trying to reform the long-term care system, the institutional bias. And so, you know, we knew that, you know, fundamentally, you know, we were not going to be able to just change what we wanted to change by changing the health and human services policy. We, it needed a congressional fix. So we drafted a piece of legend, legislation called the Meditate Community Attendance Services Act. It was Mikasa was its, its name, which is my home in Spanish. You know, again, that has evolved to Mikasa with two S's, and so a lot of people who speak Spanish think we spell wrong. But we did that because we, again, building that coalition, the developmental disability community, thought that attendance services only meant for people with physical disabilities. Though the bill didn't only address physical disabilities, they said that's what the name means. But so we had a discussion and they felt comfortable if we changed it to community attendance services and support, that would, you know, capture the people with cognitive disabilities. And so that's how we cast it too. So but we actually saw that we needed that legislation, you know, to get the change at the same time that we're doing sort of state and local direct actions. And it also helps because as simple as this may sound, you can't organize unless you have something to organize around. And Mikasa has really helped in terms of focal up, putting a focus on what needs to happen with the long-term care system. Talk about um, some of your favorite street theater experiences. It, yeah, one of the things that we did that I think was it was at, at the state level, but I think it was really creative. Uh, we had an attendant services freeze in Texas, and so we were going to go to our Department of Human Services to testify, which you know is usually pretty dull and traditional. And we we had about thirty-five people coming to testify. And we always have this thing where everybody who comes testifies. We just don't have one person testify and, you know, everyone just sit there in the audience. We always have everybody testify. But we decided what we were going to do as theater to illustrate this was we put little plastic people in ice cube trays the night before and then had them frozen in these ice cubes. And we put them in a cooler. And then as people testified the next day, we, uh, poured a little bit of the uh, frozen people on the table where they were speaking, and our message was, end the freeze. And as they were testifying, <laughs> the ice cubes were melting, you know. So that, that was, you know, something that, you know, it, it was not anything that was really illegal, nothing that was blocking or anything like that, but it basically, you know, sort of like, whoa, they went, whoa, you know, and it sort of like set the tone. And they remembered, you know, and the freeze, you know. It, and it also was fun for our people because so much of this stuff, you have to bring people back. And, you know, doing, you know, things like that are fun. And the other part of that is somebody had to put the people, someone had to go buy the plastic people, somebody had to put them in trays, somebody had to bring the cooler. See, it, it also divides the work and makes, you know, it broadens your, your who does what. So, you know, even just the fact of doing that, you know, makes it. So that was good. The other, you know, street theater or the other was, again, we've now done this 
in San Francisco nationally, and then we just did it in Washington, is we got some what is traditionally thought as police tape, and we put our own little sort of, you know, mottos on it, free our people, our homes, not nursing homes, on the tape, yellow tape, and then what we did is just basically cordoned off the whole intersections. And we did it around City Hall, all four corners around City Hall in San Francisco. Uh, the protest was around the uh, Laguna Honda, you know, nursing home, which is the world's largest nursing home out in California. And we were targeting, you know, Mayor Willie Brown there. And what we did was basically just shut down the whole building by cutting off those four corners. And we did the same thing uh, in Washington this past May, uh, right there at, at 17th in Pennsylvania. And we had that intersection closed down for about six hours, doing that same sort of theater. You know, and it's a great picture. We, we had all, we had it all sort of police, you know, tape barricaded, and then with our people there. And yeah, basically, and the crime was that we have people with disabilities warehoused in nursing homes and other institutions. And so, you know, it, it sends that message. The other things we've done, uh, and this sort of sends shudders to some people, we, we've uh, had, uh, we've hung uh, wheelchairs on, on crosses in front of buildings, you know, saying, you know, don't crucify, you know, people with disabilities in nursing homes and other institutions, it, you know. Uh, our Denver group once did and uh, erected a cross and hung a wheelchair in front of the Archdiocese of Denver uh, because their building was inaccessible. Uh, you know, and again, that's a perfect illustration if you do what people are comfortable with. In Denver, they felt good about that. I can tell you that in South Texas, which has a very religious Catholic population, you would never you know, hang a, a, a wheelchair on a cross because that would be unacceptable to the people down in that area. So you do, you know, you do these various different things. And, and the, the thing about theater is that it involves a lot of people. You have to think about it, and it's fun, you know, and it, it, it sort of illustrates the, the issue, but it also sort of like throws the, the, the power base off balance. You know, you're doing something out of their expectations. You know, so it has a lot of different you know, positives in terms of, of group dynamics that works, you know. Bob, who does the street theater? Or when do you decide that street theater should turn into civil disobedience? Um, again, you know, civil disobedience is something that is, is part of direct action, but needs to be done very seriously, you know, and uh, we, when we get people to come to an action, you know, we always say that, you know, it's, it's an individual choice, you know, and it, you want to use it when all other alternatives have, have failed. You know, you don't want to arbitrarily, you know, put people in, in, in danger of getting arrested because it's a very serious thing to get arrested, you know, um, when, you know, you're still at the point where negotiations or something can work. You know, uh, everybody used to say, oh, all you want to do is get arrested. You know, but again, it, it's really a tactic that shows the commitment of the group. So, and usually it happens at also in a time when your your group is at a size, you know, where uh, you you can actually pull it off. Uh, you also, when you when you do something like civil disobedience, it's it's another whole level. You have to make sure that you have some legal counsel. You have to, you know, make sure that people are ready in terms of, you know. Going to jail is not a game. You know, you have you have to get everybody ready in terms of what their medication might be, what their attendance needs might be. You know, um, but we we encourage people to if you know we have planned to push an action to an arrest. You know, it, and and we always know or sh mostly always know if the action is could result in, in an arrest. Again. The last one we did on the 17th in Pennsylvania. My prediction was that we would be on the in the intersection of 17th and Pennsylvania for 12 seconds. I thought they would arrest us so quickly. I mean, 9/11 had happened. We were like right there at the White House, high security. I mean, I would I didn't think they would let us stay in that intersection. Like I said, 12 seconds. So. 
the people who were in that intersection, in that group, knew that if they were there, they were going to get arrested. Or so I thought. So, but we had to plan that. So uh, we were there six hours, and we never did get arrested. We actually got what we want. I was total, I'm always amazed at these things, you know, in terms of the dynamics of what happened and doesn't. But we were ready for that. The people who were there were ready for that. We knew exactly. We had a count in each of the areas of how many people would be willing to get arrested. Because, again, you know, the other thing about civil disobedience, especially when you're doing a multi-day protest, is that if everybody gets arrested one day, you don't have anybody for the next day, or potentially not anybody for the next day. Or you got to make sure that you don't have all your leadership arrested, and then who's going to get everybody back? So, you know, when, when again, that's another level of, of planning that has to happen. You know, so when I talked about the day leaders and the color leaders. Well, we will usually have half the day leaders say, okay, you know, if, if it comes to arrest, you know, you guys will get arrested, the other half won't. Same thing with our color leaders, because again, if we have 500 people, let's say 200 people get arrested, well, you still have 300 people, you have to get back to the hotel. So, so you need leadership to make that happen, you know, and so, um, but it's, it's, like I said, it's usually when, you know, your, you know, you, your negotiations have just sort of broken down. They just won't give you anything. Uh, and sometimes it's just the, uh, the decision by the police. You know, uh, you know again, uh, in Washington, D.C., it's been very, very difficult to get arrested. I mean, they will, they will try to negotiate with us, and, and pretty much we've gotten what we want. So it's also very important of how you couch your demands. You know, if, if, if you couch your demands so pie in the sky, well, then the only way you can get out of it, or that's what I call it, getting out of it, is to get arrested, because you know you're not going to get that. But if your demands are something that are givable, like, you know, meeting with Mitch Daniels, the head of OMB, then even though that seems sort of, you know, very hard to get, at least it's, it's, it's something that can be negotiated with, you know, and gotten, and in this case, we did get it. You've been doing this for a lot of years. Too many. <laughs> Deal with uh, your own burnout and re and re and getting new energy and replenishing and renewal. And what do you advise how to help others deal with that? Well, I, one one thing I, I think is that um, is that anger. I'm, I'm always amazed, and you know, that I haven't burnt out more than I have, um, is that, um, you know, it's, it, I seem to be on a constant burn, so I don't know what, personally, why that is, but it, it is, is that. But the other is, is that I think what's helped a little bit is that, you know, when you see victories and you see things moving and, you know, changing, the other is that, you know, again, there's been some growth, there's been some expansion of leadership. You know, again, we still need more young people in our movement because, uh, you know, again, like myself, you know, they're getting older and, uh, you know, burnout is happening, you know. But I think if, if you, if, uh, again, if you keep it varied, you know, if you can keep your organizing strategies varied, you know, and if you keep the folks around you involved, you know, I think, you, you know, they, we kind of pump each other up and, you know, sort of support us. And again, finding other people so you don't end up doing everything yourself, you know, so you can, and we've, in ADAPT, <clears throat> have expanded our leadership ring so that it's gotten wider and wider and there are more people. So in, in point of fact, actions become a little bit easier because people take on other responsibilities and uh, to a large degree, it just happens, you know, so that, so I think that's part of it, you know, in terms of that. But I think it's also, you know, you got to have some victories. You know, you got to have some things, seeing that it's moving, you know, in terms of that. And on this issue, which is, you know, reforming the long-term care system, you know, though we're still a long way from the nirvana we need to be at, you know, there has been changes in terms of that. And, you know, we're, I think that's what keeps at least me sort of going, that knowing that since we started, a lot of people have gotten out of nursing homes and other institutions. and. I think it's because of what ADAPT, you know, has done. And so, 
you know, if, if in fact, you know, ADAPT was not there, you know, I think a lot of lives would be, you know, changed. What do you tell other people? How do you, how do you help other people who may not quite a, have the energy right. reserve you have? I guilt them. No, I don't know. I think <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I th sometimes I really don't per you try to guilt, but I, I just sometimes they ask me that question, and I think just doing it guilt trips them. Uh, well, I, you know, I think people need to be challenged. I really do. You know, I mean, it's it's. Uh, you, you, I think people sometimes, you know, will do more than they uh, think they can if they're challenged to do that, and. And also, I mean, I, I, I honestly believe there's sort of an obligation, you know, in terms of doing that. I mean, uh, there's a lot of things out there that you can do with your life. And again, you know, I don't think it's so horrible to give some of it back as a disabled person to the disability rights movement. You know, there's a lot of things so with the passage of ADA and a lot of things that happened before I got involved that laid the foundation for that, you know, and the, some of the people that got ADA passed, you know, uh, really, you know, fought a lot. And so, you know, I think, you know, we need to keep reminding, you know, the people who are doing this, plus a lot of the young people, that, you know, this was, you know, hard fought. And again, it's not just the disability rights movement. I think the women's movement, the, the people of color movement, are all experiencing that same sort of thing as, it, you know, we. We've passed out of the 60s, and, you know, the, the youth are, you know, post the 80s, which is Ronald Reagan, Bush, Clinton, and now Bush again. And so the political environment's more conservative. So I think it's really important for those of us that, you know, are doing this kind of organizing to sort of challenge the folks and sort of try to bring them around and say, hey, you know, um, you know things are not like it is just because you know, people gave it to us, people fought for it. And, you know, sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. But, you know, I think we just need to keep priming the pump.